is the author of I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist, an incredible book on apologetics, and he's going to blow your mind tonight. So we're giving the floor to him. Please welcome Frank back. We're here this morning or we're somewhere else at the time. All right, how many of you are here right now? How many don't respond to surveys? Three out of 10 don't respond to surveys. How many were not here, not here this morning at any time, didn't see any of it? Where were you? Come on. Actually, let me do a very short review of what we covered this morning for those of you that weren't here because the whole presentation builds on itself. We started out by talking about Petty Officer Michael Monsor, United States Navy SEAL, who in 2006 in Ramadi, Iraq, actually dove on a grenade to save his friends. He, of course, died. And the United States Navy actually named a ship after him, the USS Michael Monsor. It is docked right down in San Diego. And we asked the question, Michael Monsor sacrificed himself to save his friends. The question is, would anyone sacrifice himself to save you? And the answer is, someone already has. His name is Jesus of Nazareth. But we said that a lot of people don't think the story's true. They think it's invented. They think it's a made-up story. It was written down by religious people. Religious people tend to embellish things. Not only that, it's got miracles in it. We don't seem to see miracles. Why would we think miracles occurred 2,000 years ago? And we said... It's actually fairly easy to show that Christianity is true. You only need to look at four questions. You need to investigate these four questions. And if you answer yes to these four questions, then Christianity is true. What are the four questions? What's the first one? Is there truth? Does truth exist? Second, does God exist? Third, are miracles possible for? Yes, yeah, the New Testament, true. In other words, is it telling the truth about the resurrection? So truth, God, miracles, and the New Testament. And this morning, we spent some time on the first question, does truth exist? Because obviously for Christianity to be true, truth has to exist. It can't just be my truth or your truth, right? It's got to be really true, what corresponds to reality. And uh, we said that whenever you start talking about truth, you always have to start with Jack Nicholson. <laughs> now, don't blow this like you did this morning. <laughs> Let me remind you how Nicholson said it. I want the truth. You can't handle the truth. All right, let's try it. I want the truth. You can't handle the truth. Very good. You learned since this morning. Because <laughs> this morning you were a bunch of sissies. You can't handle the truth. Well, we said that a lot of people claim there's no truth. You got your truth. I got my truth. All truth is relative. We, we, we talked about that this morning. And uh, we said that when someone utters one of these statements that you hear in our culture today that sounds like maybe it could be true, you ought to apply the claim to itself or turn the claim on itself. And for example, we said when someone says there is no truth, you should ask that person a question. What should the question be? Is that, is that true, right? This is a statement that claims to be true while also stating there are no truth claims or their truth doesn't exist. It's like saying I can't speak a word in English, right? It's a self-defeating statement. And you remember this morning we went through several of these statements. When someone says there are no absolutes, what question are you going to ask? Is that an absolute? And the reason, the reason you're doing that is because you're going to turn the claim on itself. How about if somebody says, uh, it's true for you, but not for me? What are you going to say? Is that, true? is that true for everybody, right? It's a claim that actually says truth is relative, but it's actually really saying, if you think about it, that it's also absolute. It can't be both or the other. It can't be objective in one sense and subjective at the same time. Uh, how about if somebody says you can't know anything? This is something we didn't do this morning. Somebody says you can't know anything. What do you say? How do you know that you can't know, right? How about if somebody says all truth depends on your perspective? You've probably heard people say this. Well, that's just your perspective. You know, if you brought up in Saudi Arabia, you'd think differently, right? What do you say to that? All truth depends on your perspective. Does that truth depend on your perspective, right? 
You see, people on one hand are trying to say truth is completely relative. On the other hand, when they say that, they're actually making objective truth claims. And we said, uh, when someone says you ought not judge, what are you going to say? Yeah, then why are you judging me for judging? It's a judgment. Jesus didn't say don't judge. He said judge not lest you be judged. He's basically saying don't judge hypocritically. He's not telling us not to judge. He's telling us how to judge. In fact, elsewhere in John 7, 24, he says, stop judging by mere appearances and make a right judgment. Everybody makes judgments. Atheists make judgments. The only question is, are your judgments true? And we summed it up this way. We said, can everybody see that this statement right here shoots itself? <laughs> right? So what this means is that objective truth actually does exist. Any attempt to deny it actually affirms it. So truth does exist, which means relativism and postmodernism, the viewpoints that say there is no objective truth, are false. And tragically, most of our universities, many of our high schools, buy into this nonsense that there is no truth. They're charging you 50 grand a year to teach your kids the truth that there is no truth. Isn't that crazy? And we buy into it. And we also said when we go to a college campus, when we get someone at a microphone who's a non-believer and they express any hostility at all, I'd normally ask them this question. If Christianity were true, would you become a Christian? And a lot of people will honestly say, no, I wouldn't. Why should you use that question? It shows you really what's going on in their hearts. It's, most of the time, it's not a head problem. It's a heart problem. They don't want it to be true. They want to go their own way. They're looking for God as much as a criminal is looking for a cop. They're running. They don't want there to be a God because they want to be God of their own lives. So always ask the question, if Christianity were true... Would you become a Christian? How about if somebody is hurt by somebody in the church? What question might you ask them? Yeah, when somebody plays Beethoven poorly, who do you blame? You don't blame Beethoven. So when somebody plays Christ poorly, don't blame Jesus. Just because I'm not true and beautiful doesn't mean Jesus isn't true and beautiful. And in fact, as we'll see here a little bit later, you should expect Christians to be flawed because we're all flawed. We all need a Savior. All right, so... We said truth does exist. The next question is, does God exist? This is all new material. You guys ready to go? Yeah. All right. I said that there are three arguments we're going to look at for the existence of God. There are more arguments for God than this, but these are just the three we're going to look at. And we spent a fair amount of time in the book talking about these arguments. The first is from the beginning of the universe, known as the cosmological argument. Now, cosmological comes from the Greek word cosmos, which means world or universe. And it says that the universe had a beginning then it must have had a beginner. The second argument is the argument from design, known as the teleological argument. You may know that telos is a Greek word meaning design or purpose, and it says if there's design in the universe and design in life, you, there has to be a designer. Now, these two arguments have some scientific evidence behind them. We'll see a little bit of that here in a minute. The third argument doesn't have any science behind it. It's more philosophical in nature, yet it's the argument you've all understood since you were a very small child, it's the argument from morality known as the moral argument. And it says that there's one thing morally wrong out there, just one. Like it's wrong to torture babies for fun. Or it's wrong to murder six million people in a holocaust. Then there has to be a God. Why? Because if there is no standard beyond humanity, then everything's just a matter of opinion. It would just be your opinion against a baby torturer's opinion or your opinion against, say, Hitler's opinion. Well, we know that torturing babies and the Holocaust aren't just matters of opinion. It's objectively true that those are evil activities. If that's the case, there must be a standard of goodness, of righteousness, of justice that we're obligated to obey. That standard is God's nature. If God doesn't exist, there's nothing objectively right or wrong about anything. We'll get to that later, but we've got to start right here at the first argument, the cosmological argument. Now, you've got to admit, it was worth coming back here tonight <laughs> just to see God do that. Some of you have said, I've never seen God move. Oh, really? Check this out. <laughs> now, this is the argument that many say points back to the big... <laughs> now, I know some of you, got, some of you are going, uh, Frank, uh, you know we're Christians in here, and uh, we don't believe in the Big Bang. 
You guys don't believe in the Big Bang? I believe in the Big Bang. I just know who banged it. In fact, the evidence for the Big Bang is so good that even atheistic scientists have, have admitted it. Stephen Hawking, who was probably the top physicist in the world until he died about five years ago, and as I say, he was an atheist, put it this way. He said, almost everyone now believes that the universe and time itself had a beginning at the Big Bang. Now, Hawking tried to come up with another explanation other than God for the creation. He failed, but he's admitting the data. What's the data? That space, time, and matter literally came into existence, and there was no space, time, or matter prior to that. It just came into existence out of what we would say nothing. What could have caused that? We'll see that here in a minute. It's not just uh, atheistic scientists, even agnostic scientists, like uh, Alexander Vilenkin, originally from Russia, now teaches at Tufts University. He's a cosmologist. He wrote this. He says, with the proof now in place, cosmologist, by the way, a cosmologist is not someone that puts on your makeup, all right? <laughs> cosmologist studies the origin of the universe. Cosmologists can no longer hide behind the possibility of a past eternal universe. There is now no escape. They have to face the problem of a cosmic beginning. Now, notice two interesting words in this quote. The first interesting word is the word proof. Unusual for scientists to use the word proof. Why? Because science, by definition, is tentative. I mean, you can always get new information in that maybe overturns a previous theory. In fact, um, I know you can't trust everything you see on Wikipedia, but Wikipedia actually has a page of overturned scientific theories. There's nearly 100 of them. You know, previous theories that have been overpowered or overturned by later evidence. And so, for him to use the word proof, that's a pretty strong word. But he's seen so much evidence line up toward one conclusion that the universe had a beginning that he's willing to call it a proof. Also, the interesting word here on the bottom, the word problem. The problem of a cosmic beginning. Why is it a problem that there was a cosmic beginning? Because if you're a scientist and you think everything happens by natural causes, how can the whole universe, how can nature itself be caused by a natural cause? If nature itself came into existence, whatever created nature can't be made of nature. It's got to be something beyond nature, something we would call supernature. We'll get to that in a minute. Now, we're not going to look at the evidence for this. Why? Number one, it's all in the book, chapter three. Number two, and we don't have time to go through it all. It's, there's a lot of it. And number three, it's not controversial. Even the atheists are admitting it. It's not controversial that there was a beginning. What's controversial is what caused the beginning. So let's take a look. If the universe had a beginning, it seems we must have, it must have had a beginner. We've got two options here. Either no one created something out of nothing, which is the atheistic view, or someone created something out of nothing, which is the theistic view. Now, which view is more reasonable? That no one created something out of nothing or that someone created something out of What do you think? Yeah, number two, right? I've had an atheist once say, oh, I think number one is more reasonable. I said, number one? Let's look at number two for a second. Number, number two says someone created something out of nothing. Now, that's a miracle, right? But at least you got a miracle worker. You got someone. Number one is a miracle with no miracle worker. That's clearly absurd. Do you realize, by the way, that everyone believes in at least one miracle? I mean, Christians, we believe in more than one. We believe in this and many others. But you know, atheists, some atheists, they believe in a miracle. They believe in the miracle that no one created something out of nothing. Now, which view takes more faith? What do you think? It takes a lot more faith to believe number one rather than number two. In fact, this guy, this atheist who said this, we were at Texas A&M, and he said number one is more reasonable, that no one could create something out of nothing. And I said, to show you how seriously we all take the law of causality, and by the way, law of causality doesn't say everything has a cause. The law of causality says everything that comes to be has a cause. There has to be an uncaused first cause somewhere because you can't go on an infinite regress of causes. Ultimately, you're going to get back to an uncaused first cause. Anyway, I said to the audience at Texas A&M that night, I said, to show you how seriously we all take the law of causality, that things don't pop into existence out of nothing, by nothing, without a cause, there is nobody in this auditorium here tonight who is currently worried that as you sit here, a hippopotamus has appeared out of nothing, by nothing, in your dorm room and is currently pooping on your pillow. Right? <laughs> you don't worry about that. You're not worried that a raging Bengal tiger is just going to appear right here at Godspeak Church, right in the middle of this sanctuary and start devouring people, right? 
Because you know that things don't pop into existence out of nothing by nothing without a cause. And if the whole universe could do so, why doesn't everything do so? Why don't Teslas pop into existence out of nothing by nothing without a cause? You wake up one morning, you look in your driveway, your Hyundai is a Tesla. And you go, how do I charge this thing? Why don't MacBook Pros pop into existence out of nothing by nothing without a cause? Could have saved me three grand. Hey, if you're hungry after this and you want to have a pizza... Does it make sense to order one? Or should you just sit in your kitchen, wait, and hope? <laughs> one pops into existence out of nothing, by nothing, without a cause. Now, it's the atheists that have all the faith. Now, ladies and gentlemen, if this is really true, and it seems to be, then a question you can ask the atheists is this. If there is no God, why is there something rather than nothing at all? In other words, if there is no God, why does anything exist? Now, if space, matter, and time had a beginning, what could have caused that? The only thing that it seems could have caused it is something that is spaceless, timeless, immaterial, powerful to create the universe out of nothing, personal in order to choose to create. Why personal? Because to go from a state of, to a, from a state of nothingness to a state of creation, someone had to make a choice, and only persons can make choices. Also, the being would have to have a mind in order to be able to make a choice. So when you think about a spaceless, timeless, immaterial, powerful, personal, intelligent cause, who do you think of? God. You say, how do you know it's the Christian God, Frank? We don't. Yet, this could be Allah or some other theistic or deistic God. We don't know yet. But if we keep going through the evidence, if we keep going through this evidence and then miracles and then the New Testament, and we realize that Jesus rose from the dead... Then we can say that the same being who walked out of the tomb 1,990 years ago is the same being in whose divine nature created the universe out of nothing. We haven't gotten there yet, but we got six attributes for what could be the God of the Bible from this one argument. All right? A lot more in the book on that. Let's go to the teleological argument. We'll spend more time on this. There are two aspects of this argument. One is the fact that the universe appears to be designed, and the second is that you, life, appears to be designed. But let's look at the universe first. Scientists have discovered in re recent decades that the universe is fine-tuned to support life here on Earth in particular. That if you were to change any one of a number of factors virtually imperceptibly about our universe, our universe would either not exist, or if it did exist, it couldn't support life. And even atheists admit this. Again, Stephen Hawking, an atheist, put it this way. He said, if the expansion rate of the universe was different by one part in a thousand million million a second after the Big Bang, the universe would, collapse, would have collapsed back on itself or never developed galaxies. In other words, the expansion rate from the very beginning seemed to be precisely fine-tuned to create this universe. If it was slightly different either way, we wouldn't be here. Now... You can't make any sort of evolutionary explanation for this. Why? You can't say, well, you know, maybe it just evolved to that expansion rate by chance, whatever that means. No. The expansion rate started there. This is the initial condition. What could have caused that? Seems to me the same being that created space, matter, and time is the same being that fine-tuned the expansion rate to be precisely what it needed to be so this universe would exist. Also, the gravitational force if it were altered by more than 1 in 10 to the 40th power compared to the strong nuclear force, we wouldn't exist. What's 1 in 10 to the 40th power? That's one part in 1 with 40 zeros following it. You say, Frank, I can't get my head around that number. I know, neither can I. Let me give you an illustration. Take the entire North American continent from, what is it? Is it El Salvador all the way on up to Greenland? And stack it in dimes to the moon, 238,000 or so miles. And then do that on a billion other North American continents. Stack them in dimes to the moon. Take all those continents together, mix up the pile, mark one red dime in there, mix the red dime in that huge pile, blindfold a friend, throw him in the pile, say pick a dime, the chance that he'll pick the one red dime is one chance in 10 to the 40th power. Is he going to pick that red dime? No. This is a fine-tuned universe. You say, well, maybe it just happened by chance. Ladies and gentlemen, is chance a cause? Does chance cause things? Who caused this? Chance. He was just here. No. <laughs> chance is not a cause. Chance is a word we use to describe mathematical possibilities. Chance doesn't do a thing. You know what scientists mean? 
when they use the word chance? We don't know. That's what they mean. Look, there's only two possibilities for this value being where it is. Somebody designed it to be there, or it wasn't designed to be there. What makes more sense, do you think? Somebody designed it to be there. Now, it's not just the universe, and this is just two of it, at least a dozen of these parameters about our universe. It's not just the universe that is fine-tuned. And by the way, if you change any one of these parameters, we wouldn't exist. But it's not just the universe. Our solar system appears to be designed with us in mind as well. In fact, let's take a look at our solar system here. Here we are, third rock from the sun. If we were just a little bit closer to or a little bit further away from the sun, we couldn't survive. A little bit closer to, we'd burn up. A little bit further away, we'd freeze. We are what scientists call the Goldilocks zone. It's not too hot. It's not too cold. It is... That's a lie. It's too cold here in the winter, too. It really is. The axial tilt, 23 and a half degrees. Change that slightly, we don't exist. Earth rotation, 24 hours. Change that slightly, we don't exist. The size and distance of the moon from us. Change that slightly, we don't exist. If Jupiter was not in its current orbit, we couldn't exist here on Earth. Why not? Because Jupiter's gravitational force is so strong that it attracts most of the meteors and space junk to it rather than us. It's a cosmic vacuum cleaner. In fact, if you take a close-up look at Jupiter, you know what these purple marks are? Those purple marks are comet fragment strikes that are bigger than the Earth. Thank God for Jupiter. Because if Jupiter wasn't there, we wouldn't be here. Saturn does the same thing. Uh, in fact, you want to see the size of the planets? Hey, what happened to my sound effects back there, Micah? Come on. There's Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, Earth. Look at poor Pluto down here. You know, Pluto recently has been demoted as a planet. I don't know about you, but I think it's size discrimination. <laughs> and what if Pluto identifies as a planet? What then? You bigots. Take a look at this. You can hardly see Pluto. Take a look at this. That's Arcturus. That's another star in our galaxy. Here's the sun over here. Jupiter is one pixel in size on this scale. Earth is invisible. Pluto, forget about it. All right, keep an eye on Arcturus now. Where's Arcturus now? That's Antares. That's another star in our galaxy. Here's the sun. It's one pixel in size on this scale. Jupiter is invisible. Earth, Pluto, forget about them. In fact, if the Earth was the size of a golf ball, Betelgeuse here... Look, I don't name the stars, all right? If the Earth was the size of a golf ball, Betelgeuse would be five or six Empire State Buildings high. And that's just in our galaxy. That's not outside our galaxy. All these stars are inside our galaxy. And the average distance between stars in our galaxy is 30 trillion miles. And all that distance is necessary for us to exist here on Earth. Now, 30 trillion miles, how far is that? Far. It'll take you at least two tanks of gas and a Toyota Prius to go 30 trillion miles. In fact, when the space shuttle was in orbit, the space shuttle was traveling at about 18,000 miles an hour. That's five miles per second. You got trouble getting to work in the morning? Take the space shuttle. Be five miles a second, think about how fast that is. Well, I did a little calculation to try and figure out how long would it take if we could get in the space shuttle and go from our star, the sun, to another star an average distance away inside of our galaxy if we could go five miles a second. In other words, how long would it take us to go five miles a second or how, how, how long would it take us if we could go five miles a second to go 30 trillion miles? How long do you think it would take us? You guys are sounding like Charlie Brown's teacher right now. <laughs> a long time. You must be a math major. Yeah. It would take us 201,450 years. That means if you got in the space shuttle at the time of Christ and started traveling from our star, the sun, to another star an average distance away inside our galaxy. You've been going five miles a second for 2,000 years. You would be less 
than one hundredth of the way there right now. And we're going to explore space. No, we're not. We're not going anywhere in space. We can hardly get out of our solar system. It took us nine years to get to Pluto. I mean, you realize, if our solar system was the size of a quarter, with the sun at the center, Pluto at the outer rim, you know where the next nearest star is? It's two football fields away. And it took us nine years to get to Pluto. Forget about it. We're never going to, it's just too far and it's too dangerous. And even if we go light speed, light speed, 186,000 miles per second, how long is it going to take us to get to the next nearest star? Almost four years. We're never going to get there. Well, imagine we somehow figure out space travel and we do get to another planetary system. In fact, no, what I'm about to show you is a little bit disturbing, but since you're a mature audience, I'm going to show it to you anyway. Imagine we get to another planetary system, we plan our flag, and then this happens. Beans are not for astronauts, ladies and gentlemen. In fact, just to show you how analytical my wife is, and she's in the room right now, but I can't point her out or she'll shoot me. But when I showed her that little video, she smiled just a little bit and she said, that's illogical, there's no sound in space. <laughs> now look what the psalmist says about space. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. How high are the heavens above the earth? Well, the Hubble Space Telescope has helped us discover that. In fact, about 20 years ago, they trained the Hubble Space Telescope on 1 26 millionth of the sky. What's 1 26 millionth of the sky? Go outside tonight, put a piece of rice on the end of your finger, hold it up. That piece of rice represents about 1 26 millionth of the sky. So they trained Hubble for 11 days of, expo of exposure time on this little spot of the sky to see what was out there. This is called Hubble Ultra Deep Field. You can Google this. What I'm about to show you is in the public domain. I don't know if you can see the bottom of this here, but these are mountains down here, right? And uh, this is the southern hemisphere. What I'm going to do is show you this little video they put together to show you what's out there in this 1 26 millionth of the sky. When I start playing it, you're going to see the constellations come up and then you're going to see Hubble zoom out to that little dot. Uh, there's no audio, it's just video. You ready? Here it is, Hubble Ultra Deep Field. There are the constellations. Now let's go see what they found in 1 26 millionth of the sky. What you're looking at are nearly 10,000 galaxies in one twenty-six millionth of the sky. Each of these galaxies apparently having billions of stars of their own. Now, how many stars are there in the entire universe? If you find... 10,000 galaxies in one twenty-six millionth of the sky. How many stars must be out there? Researchers at the University of Hawaii think they figured it out. The number of stars in the universe are about equivalent to the number of grains of sand on all the beaches, on all the earth, times 100,000. And to go from one star to another star just in our galaxy going five miles per second will take you over 200,000 years. Now you know why the Bible says the heavens declare the glory of God. By the way, I never want to hear anyone ever again at God Speak Church ever use the word awesome 
unless you're talking about God or the heavens. Awesome shot, dude. Awesome shirt, dude. Awesome TikTok video. No! <laughs> what word are you going to say for God? Save it. In fact, the heavens, if they're going to declare the glory of God, we're actually in trouble. Why? Because if we look at the heavens, we get a sense of what infinity means. And if God is infinite in all of his attributes, and he is, that means he's infinite in his justice. Which means none of us are going to make it. Because we've all been unjust. How is he going to allow unjust creatures to go unpunished if he's infinitely just? Well, the second half of the verse gives us a hint. I only showed you the first half. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so great, or so far as he removed our transgressions from us. How has he removed our transgressions from us? He came to earth, added humanity to his deity, lived the perfect life in our place, and then allowed the very creatures that rebelled against him to torture and kill him. So he could take their punishment on himself, our punishment on himself. This is why Jesus is the only way. It's not an arbitrary claim. Look, I just said so. I'm the only way. This is the only way an infinitely just God can allow unjust creatures to go unpunished. He comes to earth and takes the punishment on himself. This is why Paul says in Romans 3.26, God is the just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. He remains just because he punishes sin, but he doesn't punish us. He punishes Jesus in our place. Now, when you look at the universe and you see stars equivalent to sand grains on 100,000 earths, and it would take you over 200,000 years at five miles per second just to go between two of those stars. Does that make you feel insignificant? Yeah, it shouldn't. Why? Because the heavens aren't made in the image of God, but you are. In fact, the heavens were made for you. So here's the second part of the teleological argument. You're designed. This is you in the womb at 11 weeks. Question, is this animal, mineral, vegetable, or human? In fact, let's go back even further than 11 weeks. Let's go all the way back to when your mother and your father got together to conceive you. Have you guys had this talk before? (laughs) I see some young people in here, so I'll try and be discreet. I also see some older people in here, so I'll try and be discreet as well, just in case you've forgotten how this works. When your mother and your father got together to conceive you, your mother unconsciously perfumed her egg to attract your father, and then your father sent the entire population of the United States, 300 million soldiers, toward your mother's egg. And then there was a race. And you won! Don't let anyone ever tell you you're not special. You beat out 300 million others. You have blown away anything Michael Phelps has done. (laughs) Now, seeing some of you limp in here earlier makes it hard for me to believe you were the fastest soldier in the gene pool. (laughs) But you were. Now, your soldier was 20 to 30 times smaller than a grain of salt, yet it contained half of the 3.5 billion letter software program we call your genome, all the letters in the right order, all the DNA in the right order. And your mother's egg was about the size of a period at the end of a sentence in an average book, and it contained the other half of the 3.5 billion letter software program, your genome, your DNA, all in the right order. And when your soldier and your egg came together, a new 100% genetic human being was created. You know, you have not received any more genetic information from this point till right now. In fact, there were only four things separating you from adulthood, time, air, water, and food. Those are the same four things that separate a two-year-old from adulthood. Does this have implications on the abortion issue? Yeah, we don't kill the two-year-old. Why do we kill the unborn child in the womb? Genetically, it's the same. Oh, but you can't legislate morality, Frank. All right, no extra charge for this. As I may have mentioned this morning, this was the subject of our first book, creatively titled Legislating Morality. All laws legislate morality. 
Every law declares one behavior right and the opposite behavior wrong. You can't think of a law that doesn't legislate morality. The only question is whose morality will we legislate? And when people say, don't impose your morality on me, you know what I say? Why not? Would that be immoral? <laughs> because that's what you're doing to me right now. You're saying I ought not impose ought nots, but you're imposing that ought not on me. Why do you get to impose ought nots, but I don't? Actually, the better answer is this. When somebody says, don't impose your morals on me, I think what you ought to say is, these aren't my morals. I didn't make this stuff up. I didn't make up the fact that murder is wrong, that abortion is wrong, that rape is wrong, that theft is wrong, that men were made for women and women were made for men, and the best way to perpetuate and stabilize society is to legally recognize the man-woman relationship over every other relationship. I didn't make any of this stuff up. This isn't my morality. This isn't your morality. This just happens to be the morality. The one Thomas Jefferson said was self-evident. The one the Apostle Paul said, the Gentiles are not of the law of the law written on their hearts. Look, if you have a problem with the morality, you don't have a problem with me. I didn't make it up. You have a problem with the creator upon whose nature this morality is derived. All right, no extra charge for that. Let's go back to this. From this point till right now, a construction project of astonishing complexity began taking place. Cells began multiplying at a rate of 4,000 cells per second. Brain cells began multiplying at a rate of 100,000 cells per second. For most of you, anyway. <laughs> Some cells became brain cells, others heart cells, others lung cells. How did they know how to do this? Nobody knows. Some cells went so far across you to become what they needed to become that it would be equivalent to you today walking across the United States alone. And that construction project continues to this very moment. You just made 4 million new red blood cells. You just made another 4 million new red blood cells. You just made another 4... Knock it off! How's this happening? Are you thinking about this? You're going, wait a minute, Frank. i got to concentrate. New red blood cells coming up. No, this is just happening. How is it happening? Well, Aristotle recognized something 2,400 years ago. He didn't know anything about blood cells, but he did notice that all of nature is going in a direction. For example, did you ever ask yourself, why does an egg corn, if it's properly nourished, always go in the direction of becoming an oak tree? Why doesn't it become an elm tree or a birch tree or a seahorse? You say, well, it's programmed to become an oak tree. Yeah, well, who programmed it? I mean, is, it, is an acorn conscious? Is an acorn in the ground going, all right, what do I have to do to become an oak tree? No. If it doesn't have a mind of its own, and it doesn't, yet it reliably goes in a direction, there must be an external mind directing it toward an end. This is what Aristotle called his unmove mover. Thomas Aquinas came along in the, in the 1200s AD and he said, this is going to be my fifth way to argue for God. That all of nature is going in a direction. If it's going in a direction, there must be a mind directing it. This is why we can do science, ladies and gentlemen. Because the world is orderly. Things go in a direction. They're repeatable. Because there's a mind behind the world. Now notice, this is not a big bang argument way back when. That's another argument. This is an argument that says every single second the universe exists, God is directing it. God creates you, and he creates the natural laws that govern the universe, and he sustains you in the natural laws that govern the universe. If God were to pull his hand away, we'd go out of existence. In fact, God is to, to the universe what a band is to music. Earlier, the band was up here playing music and sustaining the music, right? What happened to the music the second the band stopped playing? Music was over. Same thing is true with God. God creates the universe and the natural laws that govern it, and he sustains it every single second. If he were to pull his hand away, we'd go out of existence. This is why the Apostle Paul came along and he said, In him, in Jesus, we live and move and have our being. And Christ holds all things together. And the writer of Hebrews says, God sustains all things by his powerful word. So it's not a cause way back when. It's a right now cause. And this is why we can do science. Now, there's more in the Stealing from God book, which you can get on our website on that. But we've got to move on to our third argument, the moral argument. And the way to talk about this is, let me ask you guys a question. How do you know that your quarterback throwing a touchdown 
is better than your quarterback throwing a pick six. That's when he throws an interception. He throws the ball to the other team, and they take it back for a touchdown. How do you know? How do you know your quarterback throwing a touchdown is better than a pick six? This is the interactive portion of the program. Come on. What do you have to know? Not just the rules. Objective. You've got to know the purpose of the game, right? If you don't know the purpose of the game, there's no way to say that a touchdown is better than a pick six. There's no way. If there's no goal to the game, you can't say, well, this play gets us closer to the goal, and this play takes us further away. There's got to be a purpose. Now, notice in football, the purpose of the game comes from outside the game, when the Eagles and the Chiefs uh, last month played the Super Bowl, they wound up down there in Glendale. The field was all set. The rules were all made. Where did the rules come from? Well, the commissioner and the owners, they get together every year, and sometimes they tweak the rules a little bit. So the rules come from outside the game. Now, football's arbitrary. The rules could be different. But life isn't arbitrary. The rules also come from outside the game. The purpose comes from outside the game. And so the only way you can say that this is a good way to live and this is a bad way to live is if you know what the purpose of, of the game is, what the purpose of life is. What is the purpose of life? Well, to know God and make him known. That is correct. Too often I hear people say... Um, to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. Where's that in the Bible? That's the Westminster Confession. I'm not saying it's wrong. And what does it mean to glorify God, by the way? We Christians always throw that word, I'm here to glorify God. What does that even mean? Make his name famous. I've heard that. Know of him and love others, first, the, the first two commandments, the greatest and the second commandment. The point is, whatever the, the I, I think to know God and to make him known is correct, because from John 7, 17, 3, when Jesus is praying for us, he says, now this is eternal life, that they, meaning us, may know you, God the Father and Jesus Christ whom you've sent. The purpose of life is to know God, not just intellectually, like we talked about this morning, not just know that he exists, but to trust in him. And then when you throw the Great Commission in there, and to make him known. That's why we're here. Without purpose, you can't say, this is the right way to live and this is the wrong way to live. In fact, if there is no God, the Nazis were not wrong. It's just your opinion. Years ago, I had a debate with the president of the American Atheist. His name was David Silverman. He was Jewish, but he was an atheist. And so I was pressing him during the debate, which you can see on our YouTube channel, David, if there's no God, the Holocaust wasn't really wrong. And he tried to avoid that conclusion. And finally, I kept pressing him on it. He finally said this. You know, Frank, you're right. The Holocaust wasn't really wrong. YouTube actually took that video down. It wasn't because anything I said. It was what he said. Denying that the Holocaust was wrong. Look, I said, David, if your worldview is telling you that the Holocaust wasn't really wrong, you have the wrong worldview. Get the correct worldview, theism. You know better that the Holocaust was wrong than you know that atheism's true. So why would you be an atheist then? Also, if there is no God, love is no better than rape. Oh, you might like love better, but it's just your preference. If there is no God, there are no human rights. In fact, in our country, we've been creating rights every 10 minutes, it seems, doesn't it? And so many of the people out there claiming they have a right to this or a right to that are atheists. Do they realize there's no such thing as a right unless God exists? You don't get rights from government. Governments are, are to secure rights. Rights come from God. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men were created and endowed by their government. No, endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. And among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And governments instituted among men to secure these rights. No, if there's no God, there's no right. There's not only no right to abortion, there's no right to life if there's no God. There's no right to same-sex marriage. There's not even a right to natural marriage. There's no right to anything. It's just your opinion if there is no God. 
If there is no God, murder, slavery, and racism are not wrong. If there is no God, religious people have never done anything wrong. How often do they accuse you of being a hypocrite? You know what you do when somebody says you're a hypocrite? You ought to agree with them. Yeah, I am. I can't live completely up to what Jesus said for me to live up to. My walk doesn't completely actually adhere to my talk. I get that. But if I could walk perfectly, I wouldn't need Jesus. And by the way, when you say you claim that I'm a hypocrite, you've actually, you're actually giving an argument for God. Why? Why is hypocrisy wrong if there is no God? Is it just your opinion? Or is there really something morally wrong about being morally inconsistent? If there is no God, tolerance is no better than intolerance. Ladies and gentlemen, are Christians commanded to be tolerant? Be careful how you answer. The answer is no. Tolerance is too weak. Tolerance says hold your nose and put up with them. Love says reach out and help them. We're not supposed to tolerate evil. That would be unloving. Yet in our culture, you know what we think love means? Love means approval. Well, we know that's not the case. How many people in here are parents? All right, how many people in here are former children? Oh, okay, good. That's all of us. If your parents approved of everything you wanted to do as a child, was that, would that parent have been loving? No. You need to stand in the way of evil if you're going to love your child. You just can't let him or her do whatever he or she wants. You've got to stand in the way of evil. That's what love is. That's why Paul says love always protects. Love rejoices in the truth. Love always perseveres. Love does not rejoice in wrongdoing. You want to love somebody, you need to stand in the way of evil. You know what Thomas Sowell, the great 92-year-old uh, economist who was brought up in, in Harlem but then taught at some of the major universities around the world said about this? He said, when you tell people what they need to hear, you're helping them. When you tell people what they want to hear, you're helping yourself. Why are we, how are we helping ourselves? Look, Jesus gave us one new command. What was it? I give you one new command. Love one another as I have loved you. How did he love us? He sacrificed himself for us. You know what we're doing when we tell people what they want to hear? We're sacrificing them for our benefit. Why don't we tell them what they need to hear? Because we don't want them to be mad at us. We don't want the blowback that comes from disagreement. So what do we do? We just tell them what they want to hear. We basically enable them. We tell them what they, when we tell them what they need to hear, they may be mad at us, but we're sacrificing ourselves then for, the, for their own benefit. That's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to do what's right and leave the results to God. Now, if there is no God, you also can't complain about the problem of evil. Why can't you complain about the problem of evil if there's no God? Because if there's no God, there can be no evil. Why not? Because evil only exists if good exists. But good only exists in an objective sense if God exists. Now, C.S. Lewis, when he was a young man, he was in World War I. It was a terrible war. In fact, he lost his friend in World War I. He was injured himself. And he came out of World War I saying there can't be a good God. There's too much evil, too much injustice in the world. And then one day he had an epiphany. And he realized his argument against God didn't work. And he wrote it in the book, Mere Christianity. Here's what he wrote. He said, as an atheist, my argument against God was that the universe seems so cruel and unjust. But how would I got this idea of just and unjust? A man does not call a line crooked unless he has some idea of a straight line. What was I comparing this universe with when I called it unjust? You see, you wouldn't know what a straight line was unless you knew what a... Or you wouldn't know what a crooked line was unless you knew what a straight line was. You wouldn't know what unjustice was unless you knew what... Justice was. Something can't be not right unless something is. Something can't be immoral unless something is. In other words, evil is a lack in a good thing. It's a parasite in a good thing. It doesn't exist on its own. It could only exist as a lack in a good thing. For example, evil is like cancer. If you take all the cancer out of a good body, you got a better body, right? What happens if you take all the body out of the cancer? You got nothing, right? Evil is like rust in a car. If you take all the rust out of a car, you got a better car. What happens if you take all the car out of the rust? You got a pinto, 
All right? It doesn't exist on its own. It only exists as a lack in a good thing. In fact, you could put it this way. The shadows prove the sunshine. In order to have shadows, you got to have sunshine. In other words, in order to have evil, you have to have good. Oh, you can have sunshine without shadows. You can have good without evil, but you can't have evil without good. You can't have shadows without sunshine. So evil doesn't disprove God. Evil actually shows God does exist. Evil may prove there's a devil out there, but it can't disprove God because there'd be no such thing as evil unless there was good and there'd be no such thing as good unless God existed. But how often do you hear atheists saying there can't be a good God because there's too much evil in the world? They're presupposing a standard of good when they say that. They actually have to steal from God to argue against him. So when Christopher Hitchens, you guys remember Christopher Hitchens? He was a brilliant British atheist who sounded more brilliant than he was because he had a British accent. And I had a couple of debates with him, which you can see on our YouTube channel. He wrote the book, God is Not Great, How Religion Poisons Everything. This word poisons here is just a fun way of saying religion's evil. So I kept asking him during the debate, Christopher, what is evil? What is evil? And he never would answer directly because he has no standard by which to judge anything evil. He has to steal a standard from God in order to argue against him. But I said, Christopher, much of what you say in your book is true. Religious people have done a lot of evil things. But you're proving our worldview. None of those things would be evil unless God existed. And I said to him, Christopher, I'm a hypocrite. I can't live up to what Jesus told me to live up to. But if I could, I wouldn't need him. If I was perfect, I wouldn't need a savior. In fact, when people say to me, I can't go to church because there's too many hypocrites down there, I always say, come on down, pal. We got room for one more. <laughs> the church is full of hypocrites. Why? Because the church is a hospital for sinners. It's not a country club for saints. Yeah, I know we're saints theologically, but we, st we still have the sin nature. And by the way, religion doesn't poison everything. Everything poisons religion. I poison religion because I don't live up to the pure words of Christ. So there is a standard out there, and we know it when we see something evil, for example. And if that standard exists, then God exists. So what can we learn from these three arguments? From the cosmological argument, we can learn that this, this cause is spaceless, timeless, immaterial, powerful, personal, and intelligent. Six attributes, right? From the teleological argument, we get more information that this being is intelligent, and we also see that he sustains the universe. From the moral argument, we also see that this being is good. He's a standard of righteousness. Now think about this, ladies and gentlemen. From these three arguments... We have a spaceless, timeless, immaterial, powerful, personal, intelligent creator who created all things and sustains all things. This is the God of the Bible, and we haven't even opened the Bible yet. This is called natural theology. Everybody already knows there's a God. The only question is, is it the Christian God or some other theistic God? Now, you might say, wait a minute, Frank. Atheists have to have reasons to... Refute what you say. They've got to have arguments against what you've said. Oh, they try, but they fail. Why do they fail? Because if their worldview is true, reason itself is impossible. Now, I can't say anything better than C.S. Lewis, so I'm just going to show you what he said. Uh, and just to set this up, most atheists today are materialists. What does that mean? They don't think there's any spiritual realm. In other words, you don't have a mind, you just have a brain. You don't have a soul, you just have a body. You're just a molecular machine. You're just a moist robot. Because every thought you have is the result of the laws of physics. You're not really reasoning, you're just reacting. This is materialistic atheism today. And here's what Lewis said in response to that. Check this out. It's a, it's a two-slide quote. He said, suppose there were no intelligence behind the universe. In that case, nobody designed my brain for the purpose of thinking. Thought is merely the byproduct of some atoms within my skull. But if so, how can I trust my own thinking to be true? But if I can't trust my own thinking, of course I can't trust the arguments leading to atheism and therefore have no reason to be an atheist or anything else. Unless I believe in God, I can't believe in thought, so I can never use thought to disbelieve in God. <laughs> Boom. Boom. As John Madden would say, you can't say it any better than that. Atheists have made reason itself impossible by their ideology of materialism. So there are no reasons from the atheistic side to say that God doesn't exist. 
If their worldview is true, you should, they shouldn't trust anything they think or anything we think. But how are we going to discover who the true God is? For that, we got to move on to the third question, are miracles possible? And you're probably going, Frank, how are you going to finish all this? There's, there's a lot of material. Actually, number three is the easiest and the fastest to show that miracles indeed are possible. Now, a lot of people don't believe in miracles. In fact, miracles will turn out to be a sign from God that say, this person speaks for me. But a lot of people don't believe they've ever occurred. And some of the miracles in the Bible truly are hard to believe. Like, for example, Noah. By the way, is this being live streamed? Yes. <laughs> Let's try and keep this among us Christians. Can we all agree that Noah and the ark is crazy? Please. And um, I asked you before, has anyone seen anyone rise from the dead? Nobody said yes. Yet if you're a Christian, you've got to believe something none of us have ever seen. And for some reason, the big problem miracle in the Bible is Jonah. Is that a whale of a tail or a tail of a whale? <laughs> what is the deal with Jonah? How can you believe in Jonah? These are incredible. How can you believe these things? Well, what is the greatest miracle in the Bible? No, the resurrection is easy compared to the greatest miracle. The greatest miracle in the Bible is... I got some of you a second time. <laughs> the greatest miracle in the Bible is the first verse in the beginning. God created the heavens and the earth. If that verse is true, every other verse is at least possible, right? Now, here's the interesting thing. The atheists are admitting the evidence for the first verse. Oh, they don't think it's God, but as I said earlier, what else could create space, time, and matter out of nothing? Only something spaceless, timeless, immaterial, powerful, personal, intelligent. So if God can create the universe out of nothing, can he resurrect Jesus from the dead? Can he do the Noah miracle? Of course Noah's crazy, unless God exists. Of course Jonah's a fairy tale, unless God exists. These are easy compared to the greatest miracle. Now, I just said something you might not agree with. You, I just said, God can do whatever, whatever he wants. It's not logically impossible. You probably think, I thought, I thought God can do anything. No, there's many things God can't do. Yeah, he, he, it, yeah he, he can't do things that would go against his nature or that are logically impossible. Like he can't create a married bachelor. I know some guys try, but no. Okay? He can't create a square circle. Doesn't exist. Can't create a one-ended stick doesn't exist. Can't create a five-sided triangle, doesn't exist. Can't create an honest politician. I mean, there's some things that are too hard for God. In fact, you can do some things God can't do. Somebody said it. You lie. You can't, like, can't lie. He's the standard of truth. He can't change. What's he going to change from? He's already a perfect being. That would necessitate a change from, imper from perfection to imperfection. No, there are many things God can't do. If he could do those things, he wouldn't be the standard. He wouldn't be what we would call God. Now, a lot of people have trouble with miracles because they've never seen one. Well, that's not necessarily a good reason to disbelieve something. Why? Because you believe in a lot of things you've never seen. You believe in your mind. Have you ever seen it? You're using it right now, I hope. You believe in the laws of logic and the laws of mathematics. You ever seen those? Nope. Use them all the time. You believe in justice. Have you ever seen justice? Oh, you may have seen people treated justly or unjustly, but you've never seen justice in itself because it's not a physical thing you see. It's an immaterial virtue grounded in the nature of God. You've never seen love. And everyone believes in love. Actually, in the second debate with Christopher Hitchens, a student at the College of New Jersey asked Christopher this question. Christopher, what is love? And Hitchens, being a materialist, had to come up with a materialistic answer. You know what he said? Love is a chemical. And I said, don't tell that to your wife. <laughs> Honey, do you love me? Yeah. Why? Because I got the chemical today. You know, tomorrow I might not have it. Right now I've got it. No, love is not a chemical. Love is immaterial virtue grounded in the nature of God. You've never seen gravity. Oh, Frank, come on. There it is right there. Nope. You're not seeing gravity. What are you seeing? You're seeing the effects of gravity. You realize we, don't, we, really, we really don't even know what gravity is. You're seeing the effects. By the way, this is how we know God exists. If someone were to ever ask you, how do you know that God exists? 
from a broad perspective, what you ought to say is, I know God by his effects. If you notice, all the arguments we're talking about are effects. In other words, if there's a creation, that's the effect. I'm reasoning back to a cause, a creator. If there's design, that's the effect. I'm reasoning back to a cause, a designer. If there's a moral law written on your heart, that's the effect. I'm reasoning back to a cause, a moral law giver. If we have the ability to know what's outside of our skulls, and there are these laws of logic out there, and we can draw valid conclusions about the real world outside of our skulls, that's the effect. I'm reasoning back to a cause of mine. If there's evidence that a man predicted and accomplished his own resurrection from the dead, that's the effect. I'm reasoning back to a cause, someone that could do that, and that would be God. In fact, if you think you've ever had a personal experience somehow with God, you're doing the same thing. You're saying this experience is the effect, and I'm reasoning back to a cause, God. You're always reasoning from effect to cause. That's what scientists do. You've never seen George Washington, yet you believe he existed. Why? Because he's left effects behind that are best explained by a man that lived from 1732 to 1799. You've never seen Jesus in the flesh either, yet he's left effects behind that cause you to say Jesus actually existed and did the things he said he did. You're always reasoning from effect back to cause. So just because you don't see something directly doesn't mean they don't occur. In fact, miracles, by the way, can't occur regularly to, and be miracles. Miracles, by definition, have to be rare. If they're going to get our attention as special signs from God, they have to be rare events. If they're regular events, We'd go, hey, this stuff happens all the time. I mean, imagine if resurrections happened all the time. Imagine if people popped up from the dead routinely. What would the resurrection of Christ mean? You go to somebody and you go, Jesus rose from the dead to prove he was God. And the guy goes, so what? Uncle George just rose from the dead two weeks ago. Now I got to give the inheritance back. No, miracles have to be rare if they're going to get our attention. The only way you can identify them is against the backdrop of regular natural laws that happen over and over again. So, even if miracles were to occur today, you shouldn't expect to see many of them. Now, Christians, of course, debate whether or not miracles occur today. I personally think they do. And Craig Keener at Asbury Seminary has written a hernia-inducing two-volume set about modern-day miracles. It's like 1,100 pages long, so if you want the data on that, you can check that out. But even if miracles have not occurred since New Testament times, Christianity is still true. Christianity does not require modern-day miracles to be true. Do you know what atheism requires? Atheism requires that every single miracle claim and spiritual experience in the history of the world has to be mistaken. Is that possible? Yeah, it's possible. Is that reasonable to believe? No. One last thing. Do you know that things happen every day that um, are... If they didn't happen every day, we'd call them miraculous. Like, for example, how many people, uh, and every mother should raise your hand, it's only the fathers, really. How many people have seen your own flesh and blood born? Now, when you see that, you don't go, evolution! <laughs> right? You go, this, this is amazing. There's intelligence behind this. It happens every day. We don't call it a miracle. But there's intelligence behind it, just like there's intelligence behind the orderly world and there's intelligence behind how we're even alive in conscience. The entire world appears to be enchanted. So if someone ever were to say, I don't believe in miracles, you know what you ought to say? Look around, you're living in one. This universe is a miracle. So God can use miracles to get our attention to say, this person speaks for me. All we need to do now, after we know that since God exists, miracles are possible, and the greatest miracle of all has already occurred, and even atheists are admitting the evidence for it, is to see if there are any other miracles that have occurred, particularly when it comes to the New Testament. And the central miracle we want to look at is the resurrection. Did Jesus really rise from the dead? Because everything hinges on this. If Jesus rose from the dead, Christianity is true. If he didn't, it's not true. Simple. Now, in the book, I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist, and the other book, Stealing from God, Why Atheists Need God to Make Their Case, we have several reasons to believe that the New Testament writers are telling the truth. There's at least ten reasons. 
We can't go through all of them. We're just going to look at two very briefly. One of them is called embarrassing stories. Why embarrassing stories? Uh, historians know if they're reading something in the text that's embarrassing to the author or authors, it's probably true. Why would it be true? Yeah, you don't, you don't make up embarrassing details about yourself. You might make up ways of making yourself look good, right? But you won't make up stories that make yourself look bad. In fact, let me ask you guys a question in here. How many people in here have ever lied to make yourself look good? If you don't have your hand up right now, you're lying <laughs> to make yourself look good. And it's not working. We know you're lying. All right, how many people in here have ever lied to make yourself look bad? You don't lie to make yourself look bad. You might lie to make yourself look good, but you won't lie to, your, to embarrass yourself. Now, the New Testament writers have filled the New Testament, and this is true of the Old Testament as well, but we're just looking at the New Testament. They filled the New Testament with embarrassing stories they never would have invented. That's why we call this the duh factor. They're not making this up. Let me just give you a few of these. Notice, Peter, their leader, is called Satan by Jesus. Do you think they invented this? Do you think Mark, who wrote this down at one point, said, hey, Pete, I'm going to make this a real interesting story. I'm going to have the Lord call you Satan. What do you think Peter would have said? Have him call you Satan. Look, I'm the leader here. This doesn't look good. And then Peter says, Lord, I'll never deny you. What does he wind up doing? He denies him three times. And then at the crucifixion, all the disciples, maybe with the exception of one, they all run away. This is like a Monty Python movie. Run away. They all run away. And who are the brave ones? The women. The women are the brave ones. Now, who wrote the New Testament documents down? Men. Now, what man is going to invent that he was hiding for fear of the Jews while the women went down and discovered the empty tomb? Would any man in here invent that? I mean, if I was there and inventing it, I'd make myself look good, wouldn't you? I mean, I'd write down something like this. Let's say we marched right down there and we overpowered that elite Roman guard. Yeah, that sounds good. What do you think? Yep. John said, get out. <laughs> Peter roundhouse kicked him. Thomas said, we'll be back. No doubt. And then on Sunday morning, we marched right down to the tomb and we saw Jesus who congratulated us on our great faith. And then we went and comforted the trembling women. I would never say I was Mr. Sissy Pants why the women went down and discovered the empty tomb. And oh, by the way, why would you never say the women were the first witnesses in that culture? Forget about the fact it was embarrassing to men. It was. But independent of that, why would you never say the women were the first witnesses? Yeah, because a woman's testimony was not considered on par with that of a man. So if you're making up the New Testament story, you'd only have the men be the first witnesses. Yet all four Gospels say the women were the first witnesses, which is telling us what? They really were. In fact, one of them was a formerly demon-possessed woman. Oh, gee, what a great credible witness you got there, huh? <laughs> gee, why don't we just write her right in there? That'll make sense. I actually had a woman come up to me once, and she said, Frank, I know why Jesus appeared to the women first. I said, why? And she said, because he wanted to get the story out. <laughs> I said, that is an excellent point. I had not thought of that. Because ladies, when your man comes home from work, does he say much? <laughs> there could have been a nuclear explosion down at the plant. He's not going to tell you. You'll see it on the news before you hear it from him. You'll be watching the news going, Hey, hon, what happened? Oh, yeah, forgot to tell you. The nuke blew up. I've been hot for three days. What's for dinner? He's not going to tell you. I can't even believe this next verse is in the New Testament, but it is. You know the end of the Gospel of Matthew? This is called the Great Commission, where Jesus takes his disciples up on a hill there in Galilee. It's the climax, where he says, Go, therefore, make disciples of all nations. Notice he doesn't say make believers. He says, make disciples. There's a difference, right? Anyway, as he's standing there, the climax of the whole biography of Jesus, and his disciples are there, it says in verse 17 about his disciples, some believed, but some doubted. What? He's standing resurrected right in front of them. And they're doubting? It's like they're standing there going, you see that guy over there? Yep, that guy over there is Jesus. Oh, no, it can't be Jesus. He was, he was just killed not long ago. No, I'm telling you, it's him. 
Look, Jesus is dead. It can't be him. Oh, it's him. The Romans killed him. They whipped him. They put him on a cross. They put, they put nails through his, his arms and, and, and his legs. And then they pierced his side with a spear and blood and water came out. I'm telling you, Jesus is dead. It's him. It can't be. The Romans, if they didn't kill him, they would have been killed. I'm telling you, it's him. It can't be. It is. How do you know? The women told me. <laughs> They're not making this up. There's even potentially embarrassing details about Jesus in there. Notice Jesus is considered out of his mind by his own family who want to seize him and take him home. This is in Mark chapter 3. You may have heard the scholars say that uh, the New Testament writers embellish Jesus to be God. Oh, really? Then why is Mark chapter 3 in there? When his own family thinks he's nuts. And in fact, Mark is almost universally recognized to be the earliest gospel. Jesus' own brothers don't believe in him. That's embarrassing. In fact, how many people here have a brother? All right, how many people have a brother who thinks he's God? Yeah, you don't believe in him either. Neither did Jesus. Right? Later, though, James becomes a believer because Jesus appears to him and then dies as a martyr in the city of Jerusalem in 62 AD. How do we know? Not because a New Testament document tells us. You know who tells us this? Josephus, the Jewish historian, who was probably in Jerusalem at the time, and another writer, Hegesippus, who came later. They say, James, the brother of Jesus, dies as a martyr for his own brother. Why? Because apparently Jesus appeared to him. Also, Jesus is called a madman. He's called a drunkard. He's called demon-possessed. You think they invented this? Yeah, they're saying the Lord's demon-possessed. This is not an invented story. He has his feet wiped with the hair of a prostitute, which easily could have been seen as a sexual advance. And oh, by the way, there are two prostitutes in Jesus' bloodline. Who are they? Rahab. Rahab and Tamar. Do you think Matthew and Luke, when they put the genealogies together, said, you know what, I really think we ought to spice up the Messiah's bloodline a little bit. Let's put a couple of prostitutes in there. What do you say? In fact, there's a lot of shady people in the Messiah's bloodline. Judah, from where we get the term Jew from? Jesus, from the tribe of Judah. Not a good guy. What did Judah do? He sold his own brother, Joseph, into slavery in Egypt. David. David, a man after God's own heart. Yeah, but he's a liar, adulterer, and a murderer. Gee, I guess there's hope for the rest of us then. Bathsheba's in the bloodline. In fact, when Matthew gets to her in the genealogy... He won't even mention her name. What does he say instead? Uriah's wife. Ooh. He's telling the truth, but it's a slam, right? Who is Uriah? Husband of Bathsheba, whom David had killed so he could have Bathsheba. This is embarrassing. You don't find this, these parallels in other ancient writings. Other ancient, like Egypt, they'll sanitize everything about the Pharaoh to make him look like a god. Yet Jesus truly is God. And they keep all this embarrassing stuff in there. And then, if you're making up a Messiah to the Jews, this is not the way you do it. You don't hang them on a tree. Why? Because according to Deuteronomy 21, 23, anyone who's hung on a tree is under God's curse. Yet Jesus was under God's curse. What curse? The curse of sin that we put him under. But if you were inventing this, you wouldn't say this. By the way, there are two trees in Genesis. What are the two trees? Tree of life, tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Fast forward all the way to Revelation. What's the tree at the end of the book of Revelation? Tree of life. You know there's a tree in the middle? It's the tree they hung Jesus on. Because if they hadn't hung Jesus on a tree, since we sinned at the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, we could never again gain access to the tree of life. But if you're making this up, you wouldn't say any of this. It's embarrassing, but it's true. In fact, Dennis Prager, some of you may know Dennis. He is a, uh, he is a uh, Jewish conservative host. My friend Greg Coco. Greg's here. Greg knows him personally as well. And Greg, as you know, runs Stand to Reason, str.org. And there's John Noyes next to him. John runs his, at Stand to Reason as well. Anyway, Greg knows Dennis quite well. And I've seen Dennis talk about this. He actually says one of the reasons he thinks the Old Testament is true, in fact, his primary reason he thinks the Old Testament is true because no people group would ever invent such 
negative, embarrassing stories about themselves. This stuff got to be true. I mean, you look at the Jews in the Old Testament, they get the gold medal in sin over and over again. That nothing sanitized. So I might like to ask Dennis, well, if the principle of embarrassment works in the Old Testament, why doesn't it work in the New? Now, there's much more embarrassing testimony in the books. We've got to go one final one, and that's excruciating deaths. And this is the argument that says that these men who were in a position to know whether Jesus actually rose from the dead died excruciating deaths when they could have saved themselves by saying it never happened. Now, it's really critical that when you think about the writers of the New Testament, that all the writers of the New Testament, with the exception of Luke, all the writers of the New Testament were Jews who believed in Yahweh, they were God's chosen people. They, what motivation did they have to make up a resurrection story? None. In fact, there's two things they didn't believe could happen. A man could claim to be God, that would be blasphemy, and they didn't think anyone would resurrect from the dead in the middle of time. They knew everyone would resurrect from the dead at the end of time, according to Daniel 12, but they didn't think one guy would resurrect from the dead in the middle of time. Yet later you have these Jews saying that, yes, a man claimed to be God and rose from the dead. How could that happen? You think they invented it? In fact, let's look at the apostles' beliefs and practices before and after the resurrection. Before the resurrection, these people believed in animal sacrifice. They'd been slaying lambs to Yahweh for hundreds of years. And then suddenly Christ shows up and they go, we don't need to slay these lambs anymore because these lambs are just symbols of the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Here he is right here. Before they believed in a binding law of Moses, afterwards Christ's life has fulfilled the binding law of Moses. Before they believed in strict monotheism, afterwards they believe in a trinity, three persons in one divine essence. Yes, the trinity is hinted at in the Old Testament, but it's much clearer in the New. Before they believed in the Sabbath, in fact, they thought they could be stoned for not obeying the Sabbath. Afterwards, they're worshiping on Sunday. And Paul even says, don't let anyone tell you you have to obey any Sabbath or festival day. This is Colossians chapter 2. He's given up on the Sabbath. Why? Because the Sabbath is our rest and our rest has arrived. Jesus is our rest. In fact, out of the Ten Commandments, nine of them are repeated in the New Testament as binding on Christians. What's the only one that isn't? Keep holy the Sabbath. Before they believed in a conquering Messiah, afterwards a sacrificial Messiah, before circumcision, afterwards baptism and communion. Now, ladies and gentlemen, what would have caused these pious Jews who thought they were God's chosen people to abandon everything on the left and adopt everything on the right virtually overnight? The only thing I can think of is what psychologists call an impact event. What's an impact event? An event... An impact event is an event that occurs in your life that is so dramatic that it can change your perspective 180 degrees just like that. Some impact events are so dramatic that although you might not remember what you had for breakfast this morning, you'll remember an impact event that happened 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years ago if you're old enough. In fact, there's probably only a few of you in this room that can answer this question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. If you can remember where you were and what you were doing November 22nd, 1963, raise your hand and hold it up. Ladies and gentlemen, look around the room. You see these people with their hands up? These people are very old. <laughs> November 22nd, 1963 is my earliest memory. I was two years old in two days. Yes, I'm 61 years old now. I know, I know. I don't look a day over 60. In fact, when my wife, uh, when I turned 50, my wife was very encouraging. She said, honey, you're going to live to be 100. I said, how do you know? She said, because you look half dead already. Anyway, November 22nd, 1963, I'm a toddler. I'm standing in our home in Wanamassa, New Jersey, in the living room, and my mother is sitting on an ottoman, weeping uncontrollably in front of a black and white TV. Mommy, what's the matter? What's the matter? They killed the president. They killed the president. I can still see her right now in my mind when she was 26 years old. President Kennedy assassinated that day. She's 85 now, but I can see her right now in my mind when she was 26. Impact event. Never saw my mother cry like that. I don't remember anything before that and very little after that. Where were you when the second plane hit the tower? 
I was in my home office in Charlotte, just south of Charlotte, North Carolina, and I was on the phone talking to another pastor uh, on the north side of town. I had the TV on, and I'd seen the first tower had been hit, and the reason I'm talking to this pastor is because he wanted me to come to his church, and we're trying to figure out what the topic would be, and I said, do you have the TV on? He goes, yeah. I go, well, maybe a, a Cessna hit the World Trade Tower or something, and so we're talking. Suddenly, he screams into the phone. The second tower just got hit. I turned around, look at the TV. The second tower is on fire. I said, was it a Cessna? He goes, no, no, no. It was like a United plane. It was a, it was a passenger plane. I said, you saw that? He goes, it was just on live TV. I said, look, look, let me call you back. I hung up the phone. And for some reason that morning, I had CNN on. <laughs> the Communist News Network. And I'm not making this up, but the commentator on CNN said, one has to think there's some sort of navigational error here. <laughs> I said, navigational error? You dimwit. This is the clearest day in the history of the Big Apple. What do you think, the pilots can't see where they're going? I mean, you think Stevie Wonder's flying these planes? I mean, come on. This is terrorism. I called that pastor the next day. I said, we're going to come to your church and talk about Islam because that's what this is related to. Now, 9-11 was over 21 years ago. And for those of you who are old enough, if I were to ask you what you were doing 21 years ago, you'd all tell me. But if I were to ask you what you were doing 21 days ago, most of you are going to go, let me look at my iPhone. What was I doing that day? Why can you remember something from 21 years ago, but not 21 days ago? No impact event 21 days ago. Impact event 21 years ago. Do you think a resurrection would have been an impact event? Do you think if Jesus really did walk out of that tomb and then did miracles and taught them for about 40 days, that that would have been an impact event? Do you think they would have had any problem remembering what happened? Would they have any problem writing down what he taught them? No. That's the only way I could figure out why they would have abandoned everything on the left and adopted everything on the right virtually overnight. In fact, you might ask yourself the question, what did the New Testament writers have to gain by making up a new religion? What did these people get by saying Christianity was true? Well, first of all, they got kicked out of the synagogue and then they got beaten, tortured, and killed. Last time I checked, that was not a list of perks. We're going to start a new religion. We are? Yeah. What's it going to get us? First, we'll get kicked out of the synagogue. Then we'll get beaten, tortured, and killed. Well, sign me up. What a great idea. Why haven't we thought of this earlier? No, I don't think so. Now, sometimes I get the question. Maybe you do, too. Are there any non-Christian writers who talk about Jesus and the apostles? Yeah, there are. But they're not eyewitnesses. They're all in chapter 9 of I don't have enough faith to be an atheist. They kind of corroborate what the New Testament says. But you know what's often... Um, there's an illicit assumption behind that, that request for non-Christian writers. And the illicit assumption is this. Well, you know, you really can't trust these religious people. You know, these people invent stuff. They make stuff up. They had an agenda. You got to go to the secular and non-Christian sources to figure out really what happened. If you think about that for more than five seconds, you'll realize how stupid that assumption is. What did these people have to gain by making up a new religion? Nothing. They had everything to lose. In fact, they had every motive to say the resurrection did not happen, not every motive to say it did. Some of you, some of you may, may know my friend Jay Warner Wallace, the cold case homicide detective, who down in Torrance, California, was a homicide detective for many years. And Jim has been on Dateline more than any other homicide detective because he solves murders decades old. And uh, he then took all that skill in investing, investigating homicides and investigated the greatest homicide of all time, the homicide of Jesus. So he wrote a book called Cold Case Christianity, and you can go to his website, coldcasechristianity.com, and he's written several other great books. Anyway, Jim says that whenever he finds a body that he knows has been murdered, he says, there's only three reasons why that guy's dead. I don't need to look for a thousand reasons, a thousand motivations. It's just one of these three or a combination of these three. There was either a sex issue, a money issue, or a power issue. Sex, money, power. Those are the three things, and we talked about this this morning, that will drive people to murder. Those are the same three, three things that will cause any of us to sin. Why? Because sex, money, and power are good things. The problem is they're so good, we'll often take shortcuts to get them. So Jim says that if you're going to say the New Testament writers invented the resurrection, you've got to find one or more of those three motivators. So let's check it out. 
Ladies and gentlemen, did the New Testament writers suddenly get real popular with the ladies <laughs> for saying Jesus had resurrected from the dead? No, no sex. Did they get money? No, they were not 21st century uh, prosperity gospel preachers. Did they get power? No, they got the opposite of power. Paul, when he was Saul, had power persecuting the church. As soon as he became Paul, he was the one persecuted. They didn't get sex. They didn't get money. They didn't get power. There's no motivation to make this up. They had every motivation to say it didn't happen. So then why would they go die for a known lie? You say, wait a minute, Frank, time out. If you're going to say Christianity or martyrdom proves Christianity, don't you have to say that martyrdom proves Islam? No, you don't. Why? First of all, there's a lot of differences between the Muslim martyrs of today and the New Testament martyrs of New Testament times. But let me just give you one difference for our purposes here. The Muslim martyrs haven't witnessed anything that tells them that Islam is true. They just have faith. The New Testament martyrs, on the other hand, witnessed Jesus rise from the dead. They saw Jesus. They touched Jesus. They ate with Jesus. They verified with their own senses that Jesus had risen from the dead. Some people will die for a lie they know or they think is the truth, right? But it's a lie. Nobody's going to die for a lie they know is a lie. And the New Testament writers were in a position to know whether it was a lie or not, and they went to their deaths anyway. You can't get better evidence than that unless you were there yourselves. Now, what I'm about to say, this final comment on this, is going to sound like heresy to some of you who think that the Bible is inerrant, like I think it's inerrant. However, it's not heresy, just stick with me. Christianity is not true because a series of documents we put under one binding we call the Bible says it's true. In fact, Christianity would be true if the Bible never existed. You say, how can that be? Do you realize there were thousands of Christians before a line of the New Testament was ever written? Why? Because they didn't read about it in a book. They witnessed it. In other words, Christianity did not originate with a book. Christianity originated with an event, the resurrection. There would be no book called the New Testament, really a series of individual books put together under one binding, unless Jesus rose from the dead. There's not going to be Jews in the first century claiming a man claimed to be God and rose from the dead, unless a man claimed to be God and rose from the dead. In fact, you could put it this way. The New Testament writers did not create the resurrection. The resurrection created the New Testament writers. You would have no documents written by Jews in the first century claiming this stuff. Unless it really happened. Now, thankfully, they decided to write it down. So we could or know about it and orient our lives accordingly. But if they had never written it down, it still would have been true. We just wouldn't have known about it. Do you see the difference? Now, there's a lot more evidence we didn't have time to go through. We just talked about embarrassing stories and excruciating deaths, but there's also early sources, eyewitness details, embedded confirmation, expected predictions, extra biblical writers, explosive growth of the church out of Jerusalem, a whole bunch of other reasons. If you want to go further, you can get the book. But the overall argument is this. Does truth exist? The answer is, if somebody says there's no truth, you're going to say, is that true? Uh, does God exist? Three arguments. First one. Cosmo this is known as review. Cosmological, second, design argument or teleological, third, moral argument. Are miracles possible? Of course. Greatest miracle in the Bible? Creation. Genesis 1.1. Even the atheists admit the evidence for that. And is there evidence Jesus rose from the dead? Yeah, we just talked about embarrassing and excruciating uh, details here. So if you want to go further... Uh, text this word evidence to 855-909-0582. I gave you that number this morning. If you want this entire PowerPoint presentation and a bunch of other ones, just text the word evidence to that phone number. Also, there's books and DVDs. We've sold out of them here, but if you go to our website, crossexamine.org, click on store, you'll see them there. We're now also teaching online courses. In fact, I'm going to start a new online course in about two weeks called The Essentials of the Faith, Jesus, You, and The Essentials of the Faith. And we'll have about six or seven Zoom sessions together, live Q&A. And there are several other courses taught on our website. 
Elisa Childers, you may have heard her name. Gary Habermas, Jay Warner Wallace, I already mentioned him. Several of the instructors that you know in apologetics are on our website teaching courses. So you want to check that out. Just go to crossexamine.org, click on online courses. We're on YouTube, Twitter, and Facebook. Actually, we're so into YouTube, Twitter, and Facebook, we've actually combined these three into one social media platform. We call it You Twit Face. It's kind of a Jersey thing. Have you signed up for You Twit Face yet? We're also on Instagram and TikTok as well. Uh, don't forget about the I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist podcast. Wherever you get podcasts, you can listen to it there. The TV show is Wednesday night, 6 p.m. here on the West Coast. You can watch it also streaming on our website. And uh, the free Cross-Examined app. If you don't do anything else, download the Cross-Examined app. Two words in the app store, Cross-Examined. It's got the TV show streaming. It's got the podcast on there. It's got connections to our website. It even has a quick answer section. So... You might be having lunch with somebody, and they say something that's wrong, and you don't know how to answer it. All you need to do is take out your iPhone or your droid and go, hey, hang on. I'm getting a text. <laughs> what about this? <laughs> right there on the phone, okay? So check it out. So last thing, it's true. Christianity is. So what? So what if it's true? So what? We always ask in America, well, what's in it for me? What do I get out of this? Well, the, the best news of all, someone actually did die for you. Now, when I was in the Navy, I was in naval aviation, so we had to earn uh, golden wings, which were fairly hard to earn. But there's nothing more difficult in the Navy or maybe any military to earn than a golden trident. Very few people that start SEAL training make it through, maybe 5%. Those that do make it through wear that golden trident with pride. It is their identity. When Michael Monsoor was buried in Rosecrans Cemetery just outside of San Diego, just about every Navy SEAL on the West Coast showed up for his funeral. And when they passed his casket, they took off their tridents and pressed them into his casket. They took their identity and put their identity in the one that sacrificed for them, the one that died for them. That's what we're supposed to do. But our culture says, no, put your identity in your political party or your sexual orientation or your bank account or your vocation or your husband or your wife. Or Do you realize, ladies and gentlemen, that you can lose any of those things? Do you realize that that's a very fragile identity, something you can lose tomorrow? In fact, if you have to achieve your identity, all the pressure's on you. There's always somebody that can do it better. And what happens when you can't achieve what your identity is in anymore? What happens when you can't sexually perform anymore? You no longer have an identity? If you put your identity in your job, what happens when you lose your job? You no longer have an identity? You lose your spouse, you no longer have an identity? No, in Christianity, you don't achieve your identity, you receive your identity. Jesus has achieved our identity for us. We simply receive Jesus. This is why the Apostle John, in his biography of Jesus, in the very first chapter, says he has given you the right to become a child of God. How do you become a child of God? You simply receive the identity that he achieved for you. It's eternal you can lose everything in this life, and one day you're going to lose your life. The only thing you can't lose is Jesus. It's the most stable identity and the true identity you were meant to receive. If you haven't received it, why not receive it today? It's free. All right. With that being said, we're going to go to questions. And I think uh, Andrew's going to bring out the mic for questions. And since no one likes to ask the first question, we're going to move right on to the second question. <laughs> and so since this is being streamed, you've got to come up here so people can hear you. Uh, so just come on up to the microphone here. Ask any question you want. And uh, if you don't have any questions, I'll start telling jokes. 
Come on, once the first question starts, then, it, then, then things go forward easily. So one atom said to another atom, I just lost an electron. And the first said to the second, are you sure? And the first said, I'm positive. <laughs> That's my science joke. Come on, I'm going to run out of jokes pretty soon. We don't have any questions. Come on, there's got to be questions here. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. What's your name? My name's Abner. S Abner? Abner, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, anyone who wants to ask a question can line up. You don't have to wait for him to sit down. Go ahead, sir. Uh, <clears throat> so this is based on astrology and the Big Bang and what science says about uh, astrology. And astronomy? Astronomy. Yeah. yeah. So, well, in the Bible it says that obviously God created uh, everything. Mm -hmm. And then, but the science tells us that the reason why the moon is is uh, well, that, that the moon reflects the sun's light. That's mm -hmm. why it's lit up. Mm -hmm. uh, but in the Bible, it tells us that God, uh, what says, and God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. Mm -hmm. And he made the stars also. So mm -hmm. I don't know if, like, what you think about this. or. Well, whatever. I think this is, in a certain sense, uh, a form of poetic language. He's not trying to be scientifically precise. But when you look up, at the stars and the moon at night, it is a light in the sky, even though the source of the light is not the moon itself. Uh, we see the light from the moon because the sun's reflecting off the moon. But it's not a scientific, uh, it's not a scientific explanation of how the moon got there. It's just telling us that, yeah, the moon, God created the moon, he created the stars, he created the sun. So I think we have to be sure that when we read the text, we've got to say that what it's saying is true, but it's not describing it in a scientific way. In fact, if you really look at Genesis 1, I think Genesis 1 is a polemic against the Egyptian creation story or stories. Why? Who is Moses writing to? He's writing to people that lived 3,500 years ago who just came out of, the sci or just came out of Egypt in slavery, right? When they're walking through the desert, they're not asking the questions we're asking. They're not going, I wonder how old this place is. You know, that's not their question, right? What they want to know is Yahweh the true God or the Egyptian gods the true God. So if you read Egyptian creation stories and then you put them alongside of Moses, Moses is correcting the Egyptian creation story. In the Egyptian creation story, these, these finite gods somehow already exist and they have to fight to bring order to chaos. In the Bible, God exists independent of the universe, and he creates, and he doesn't have to fight anybody to bring order to chaos. He just speaks, and it happens, all right? I think we need to remember that when we're trying to interpret Genesis or anything in the Bible, we have to try and put our minds back into the mindset of the people to whom the Bible was written at the time. Remember, the Bible is not written to us. It's written for us. It was written to people who lived at the time, and so we have to try and put our minds back in that frame of reference. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right, good question. Thank you. All right, thank you. Yes, sir. What's your name? Uh, I'm Dylan. Dylan, go ahead, sir. So I'm just curious. if So what would be your way of refuting the idea that if God... Uh, created the universe, then who created God? Do you just refer back to the infinitude of God, or do you have a different method of refuting that? Yeah, that's an excellent question. Let's, let's just, there's a number of ways of pointing out why God is the unmade creator or the uncreated creator, but let's just go back to what we were talking about before, and that is when we said that if the universe had a beginning, Space, matter, and time had a beginning. Whatever created space, matter, and time must transcend space, matter, and time, right? So the cause must be spaceless, timeless. If you're timeless, do you have a beginning? No. See, God created time. He's not in time. So he didn't have a beginning. He's eternal. He is the uncaused first cause. So when we ask who created God, we're at really asking a question that if you're talking about the God of the Bible Although it may seem like a good question, it's really a question that makes no sense because by definition, the God of the Bible didn't have a cause. He's the uncreated creator, the uncaused first cause. And 
Aristotle, who, as you know, is not a Christian, he was a pagan, he realized there had to be an uncaused first cause. And even Aristotle, he thought the universe was eternal. But he said, even if it is eternal, you need an uncaused, unmoved mover to keep everything moving. So, ultimately, since God is outside of space, matter, and time, and he's timeless, he didn't have a cause. He's the uncaused first cause. Does that make sense? Yeah, so you'd essentially be asking who is God when you're asking the question of who, who is going to create God if God created the universe. Say that again? So you'd be, you're the person who's asking that, because I didn't ask that. My dad, my dad asked it. Yeah. So he would, he in this case would essentially be asking the question of who is God. In yeah, this in case. a sense, yeah, yeah, because if you're thinking about a created God, that's not the God of the Bible. In fact, when, sometimes when people say, I don't believe in God, you might want to say to them, what kind of God don't you believe in? And after they give you the attributes, you might say, I don't believe in that kind of God either. Okay? So defining the attributes of God, this is why it's, it's so frustrating when you, you read somebody like Richard Dawkins who wrote the book The God Delusion. Um, he has no concept of what Christians mean by God. He thinks God is just a bigger version of us, and God is more complex than us. That's not the biblical view of God. Mm -hmm. God is a simple being, meaning he doesn't have parts, he's not composed, but he has power, and he can create like just by speaking, and that's, that's even a metaphor, just by deciding he can create. He creates the universe, he creates us, he holds everything together. Okay, thank All right. you. All right, thanks, Dylan. Good question. <laughs> yes, ma'am. What's your name? Hi, my name's Mary. Say uh, again? My name is Mary. Hey, Mary, go ahead. Hi. Um, I really appreciated your, uh, uh, the reasoning this morning when you said, uh, if Christianity were true, you, you asked the person, if Christianity, I could prove that it's true, okay, would stop, you become stop right a there. Christian? Don't say if I could prove it's true. That's putting too high a standard. Okay. Just say if it were true. Okay, if Just it say were, if Christianity were, were true, true, would you become a would Christian? Would you become a Christian? Yeah. And the person says no. Uh -huh. So then what do you um, encourage us to go, whether one of your resources or to go from there? When they say no and you realize, well, that's just a, kind of an arrogance pride issue, um, because they want to be their own God in yeah. whatever form For that whatever is. For whatever reason. Right. So where do we go from there to be able to continue the conversation or at least help plant some seeds for them to act? To well, you just said it, plant themselves. some seeds. I think that the four things I mentioned earlier, and maybe there are more, is uh, pray, mm -hmm. plant seeds, love, which means doesn't mean approval, as I said, and then wait. Okay? At least do those four things. Because when somebody... If that person ever becomes open, it's probably going to be when tragedy strikes. So there's no more conversation at that point? You if they've said no, they're not interested. So you, basically, I will look forward to talking with you when you... When yeah, you or know. as I say, you could plant seeds whenever something comes up that might hint that, you know, God exists or Christianity's true. You, you can do that kind of thing. But uh, it might frustrate them if you keep coming at them with all sorts of evidence all the time. Yeah. Right? right? I mean, if a little pen light annoys somebody, shining a flashlight in their face right. is going to annoy them more. Yeah. But you can just be there for them and be a friend to them. Yep. Okay, you thanks. Know? Even God can't steer a parked car, right? <laughs> the person's, person's not driving toward God. There's nothing you can do about it. All right? Thanks. All right. <laughs> yes, sir. What's your name? Dean. Dean, go ahead, sir. Fantastic presentation today. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, question my wife wanted me to ask you is uh, <laughs> I'm here for her. asking for a friend <laughs> oh, <laughs> right. yes, yes. but uh, what would have been your hardest uh, chain of command to follow that may have went against your your faith when I was in the Navy mm -hmm. well I see I was in the Navy 30 years ago I could tell you it would be a big problem now if I was in mm -hmm. because the Navy is so woke now uh, that it would be hard for me to follow some of the commands that come down from on high. I mean, I have two sons in the Air Force. In fact, one of the sons right now, believe it or not, he, they just had their second baby. And he is on 12 weeks of, get this, non-birthing person leave. <laughs> you know what that means? He's a dad. And the, even the United States Navy or the United States Air Force can't say that. 
gee, the, the Russians and the Chinese are quaking in their boots over our military now, aren't they? This is sad. Are you, are you asking because you're in a situation where you have to? No, I'm here no. clearly for my wife. Yeah, okay, all right. She, she wanted me to ask, so. Yeah, there's, it's very difficult in today's cultural environment to stand for truth, but we have to stand for truth. Now, Rod Dreher wrote a book called Live Not By Lies. I highly recommend you get that book because Dreher went over to the Soviet Union, the, the, the former Soviet Union, and even dissidents who now live in the United States, and these people are terrified because what they see going on in the United States is a form of soft totalitarianism that they saw in the Soviet Union. Now, in the Soviet Union, it more came from government. It's not only coming from government here, it's more coming from big tech and corporations, right? Multinational corporate. Yeah, and multinational corporations, and you've got all this, you know, diversity, equity, and inclusion stuff going on, which is really code words for woke ideology. Um, and what Dreher says is that the only way people behind the Iron Curtain who were Christians survived is they got in small groups and they stayed in small groups, and they supported one another. And in fact, he even tells a story of a husband who was married to a woman, and they had six kids together. I think it was six kids. And he was put into prison as a political prisoner. And at one point, he wrote his wife, and he said, they're offering me a release. All I have to do is sign a form that say, I disavow my beliefs, and then I can come home and be with you. And his wife of six kids told him, don't do it. Stay. Pretty heavy. Yep. yep. And according to Dreher, everybody that caved to the government felt terrible about it later. The people that stood their ground, although they were in dire conditions, could, could sleep well at night. They did not compromise. They did not deny their Lord. Appreciate your answer. Yeah, thank you. Yep. By the way, one other thing about this, Dean, this happened to me over 10 years ago. Um, and the, the story that you can, you can read about it on our website, uh, I wrote an article called Sex at Work. Do not Google that, by the way. <laughs> Do not Google Sex at Work. It'll take you to Bill Clinton's website, okay? Um, just go to crossexamine.org and click on the search button and type in Sex at Work because... About 11 years ago, I was fired by Bank of America and Cisco because I had written a book called Correct Not Politically Correct, How Same-Sex Marriage Hurts Everyone. And that book, which was never brought up at work, someone on, uh, a, in a leadership class I was teaching discovered I had written that book and they fired me that day in the name of inclusion, tolerance, and diversity. So I had a discussion with the head of inclusion, tolerance, and diversity. I kept asking her questions like, what does inclusion, tolerance, and diversity mean? Why was I being excluded and not tolerated for holding a diverse view? Well, she couldn't answer any of that, so that's why we went public with it. My friend Mike Adams wrote a column called The Cisco Kid, and then I wrote a column called Sex at Work, where we explained what happened. And in today's corporate environment, you really... Uh, have to at some point you just can't keep hiding under your desk at some point you've got to say something and you might need to get legal counsel and if you ever need legal counsel go to ADF Alliance Defending Freedom because they will help you if they think it's a freedom of religion case and you got fired because of your religious worldview at your at your company they will they may take that case up all right you heard that honey <laughs> All right, thanks. By the way, there's another book that will help you c uh, converse in these, and it's written by Greg Kokel back there. It's called Tactics. I mentioned to you earlier. Get the book Tactics, a game plan for uh, discussing your Christian convictions. And in there, Greg lays out some ways you can verbalize things to ensure that um, at least you have a better chance of having a favorable result. Like one question you can ask Greg talks about is if... if you're being asked your opinion on a very controversial topic. You say, do you consider yourself a tolerant person? Well, why do you ask that? Well, the other person's probably going to have to say yes, right? That's it. They believe they're tolerant. So then you can say to them, great, because if you're tolerant, that means if I have a, an opinion different from yours, you'll tolerate it then, right? Then you can provide your opinion. If they get all angry with you after that, you can go, what happened to tolerance? Yeah. Right? I okay. That. Yeah. All right. Thank all right. You. Thanks, Appreciate Dean. you.
Yes, sir. What's Hi, your name? I, I'm Jim, and Jim. Uh, it occurs to me that in uh, very early in education, the subject of dinosaurs is hugely, hugely important, and all kids are made yeah. to see the wonder of dinosaurs. Uh -huh. There are no dinosaurs or Neanderthals in the, uh, in the Bible, therefore the Bible's wrong. Hmm. I believe that's the subtext that's being, the, that hmm. the focus on dinosaurs is that, um, and maybe I'm delusional, but... Uh, I, what do you say to to that? That the, that there is nothing in the Bible that acknowledges what we see, which are dinosaurs and Neanderthals. Okay. Well, first of all, the Bible talks about creating the land mammals and all the animals. Right. The Bible is not a book on taxonomy. It doesn't list all the different types of animals. It just says he created the land animals and he created the fish in the sea. So we shouldn't expect it to talk about every different type of animal out there. Now, if this is a question about the age of the earth, you know, Christians say, well, how old is the earth? And I always say, I'm absolutely convinced the earth is at least 61 years old. <laughs> okay? I'm, I'm going to throw my mom in there. It's at least 85. Okay? Actually, um, uh, it depends on whether the earth is old or young. And I think the better evidence is that it's old. And I even think biblically that makes more sense. Why? First of all, what does the first sentence of the Bible say? In the, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Okay, when did God create the heavens and the earth? In the beginning. Does it say when the beginning was? No. You say, what about the days? The days don't begin till verse 3, where it says, and God said. If you want to take a hyper-literal view of Genesis 1, the heavens and the earth are created before the days ever begin. Now, is there a time gap between... Verse 1, and by the time you get to verse 3, who knows? Again, I think Genesis 1 is a polemic against the Egyptian creation story. So if we're trying to date the universe by Genesis 1, I mean, you can do that. It's, it's a plausible interpretation, but it's not a necessary interpretation. So if the universe is old as it seems to be, then the dinosaurs died out long before human beings ever showed up. If the earth is young and some young earthers try and make the case that dinosaurs and men coexisted, okay, then that's a possibility. But I think the evidence is better that it's old. Remember, uh, this morning, I don't know if you're here for this, Jim, but we I talked know. about the fact that science doesn't say anything scientists do, okay? So just because scientists say this doesn't necessarily mean they're right. They're interpreting data. Maybe they're right, maybe they're wrong. Uh, so there's no conflict between the Bible and science. There are conflicts between some interpretations of the Bible and some interpretations of the natural world, but all truth is God's truth, and he's written two books. He's written the Bible, but he's also written the book of nature, and in order to understand the Bible, you need to know something about the book of nature, right? I mean, think about the first verse of the Bible. What does the first verse of the Bible assume you know? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. assumes you know, obviously, language. It also assumes you know what a beginning is. It also assumes you know, have some idea of what God is. It also assumes you know something about cause and effect, that this God, whatever this means, has created the universe and that cause and effect goes through. These are all philosophical presuppositions you bring to the first verse of the Bible. You need to know that before you can understand what the Bible's saying. So in, in seminary, when you go to seminary, this is called prolegomena. And unfortunately, it means just before theology. Unfortunately, most seminaries don't do it. They don't do all the philosophy. They just start with the Bible, which, I mean, okay, you can do that, but if you really want to be precise, you've got to start with philosophy in order to understand what the Bible means, just like you need philosophy to understand what scientific investigations mean and how to interpret the data, what is good evidence, what is bad evidence. That's all philosophical in nature. It's not scientific. Does that make sense? It does. All right. Thank, Thank you, you, Jim. God bless. Yes, Hi, sir. Hi, Frank. Nick. Um, What's your name? Nick. Nick, go ahead, sir. I have an ex-brother-in-law friend who answered yes to if Christianity was true, okay. which you believe. So I consider that an open door. Yeah. Um, so he claims to be an agnostic. Can you give me a good definition of agnostic uh, versus atheist, and would you talk to them differently? Okay. Um, a question you might ask somebody, here's the proposition. God exists. Do you agree with that proposition? In that case, you'd be a theist. Do you disagree with that proposition? In that case, you'd be an atheist. Or do you not know? 
If you say you don't know, that would be an agnostic. Means um, a cog or a agnostic means you don't know. Okay. So he's saying he doesn't know whether God exists or not. Now there are two types of agnostics. There's the ordinary agnostic and the ornery agnostic. <laughs> the ordinary agnostic is I don't know, but if you give me evidence, maybe I could know. The ornery agnostic is you can't know. And so what question would you ask the ornery agnostic? How do you know that you can't know? Right? So if he's truly open and he just says he doesn't know, then you'd say, well, why don't we, get, why don't we look at some evidence together and see if, in fact, Christianity is indeed true. Now, by the way, when you think about this, when we say, hey, why don't we look at evidence together and see if that's true? What, is, what does this presuppose? It presupposes that this is an orderly world, that you can get evidence that you can arrive at valid conclusions by looking at data. Well, what best explains that? What best explains order? An orderer, right? The very fact that we can even investigate anything. In fact, when people say there's no evidence for God, I sometimes ask them, why is there evidence for anything? You know, why, why, why would I put two parts hydrogen and one part oxygen together today, I get water? I got that yesterday, I'll probably get it tomorrow if I do it again. Because this world is orderly. And why can't my mind even know that, that that's true? All this seems to presuppose some sort of cause out there that made all this material world and our minds orderly so we could know it all. So even, even the quest for truth presupposes, in my view anyway, it presupposes a being like God. Does that make sense? Amen. Thank you. Now, do you think he's really open? Uh, it's hard to say. Sometimes I feel like I'm close. I'm going to tell him you're a click away, you know, uh -huh. but uh, he's just... Uh, Has he read Mere Christianity yet? No, he won't really read things that I send him. He'll watch videos, though. He won't read, but he'll watch videos. Yeah, if I send him something that's interesting, you know, it, okay. he'll, he'll listen to it. So yeah. he's not really excited about the pursuit. No. Yeah. So you got to drag him through. Yeah, sort of, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's a hard one. Yeah. Because, uh, as they say, most people are looking for God like a criminal is looking for a cop. He's not all that interested. Yeah. Uh, the problem is, if you want to be a leader, you got to be a reader. You can't... And there's only two ways to learn things. You can only learn things from your own experience or from someone else's experience. Of course, you can learn things from Revelation, too. But from human beings, yourself or somebody else, you don't have enough time to learn it all yourself. you got to rely on other people. Mm -hmm. And so you have to read. Now, we have plenty of videos on our website, crossexamine.org, particularly the YouTube channel. Maybe you could avail himself of some of that. And there are plenty other, there's Stand to Reason uh, you could go to. You could go to coldcasechristianity.com, and they have a YouTube, or Jim has a YouTube channel. Uh, there's, there's several places you can get good evidence if they're truly interested. Reasons.org, that's, uh, that's uh, you, Ross. You could look anything by John Lennox online. So there's plenty of resources. There's now no excuse. If people truly want to know if Christianity is true, all the evidence is out there. Amen. All right? Thank Thanks. You. Yes, sir. What's your name? I'm Paul. Hey, Paul. Um, I, and it just came to another question. Uh, do you have it on audio, audio books? Yeah, the book is on Audible. Yes, okay. sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, because that's, I have more time to listen yes, sir. to stuff in my car. Yes, sir. The other thing is that when we were talking about um, why does God have so, ha have so many bad things happen to good people if, mm -hmm. you know, if he's a good man? And it, it occurred to me when you were saying that that, that if 99% of the population were uh, paraplegics, right, you and I being able to stand up, we'd be handicapped. We'd be considered handicapped. Hmm. Because the world was there, or it's, it's only that we consider one being better than the other. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing was that I have a coworker at work that uh, he's uh, an atheist, he says. And I got to talk to him and said, well, do you believe that, um, uh, that there's life outside of, you know, in space besides us? He says, yeah. I said, well, do you think that they're at the same level of, of technological advancement that we are, you know? Um, he said, well, probably not. And I says, okay, so they're either less or more. Mm -hmm. But if there's a difference there, then that means if the, if the space is infinite, there's another one that's even more 
uh, technological advance. And more than that, there's even one that's mm -hmm. more advanced than that. And mm -hmm. it goes on to what's, what's the greatest number? N plus one, you know? Mm -hmm. If there's one that, you know, no matter how advanced you are, and he says, yeah, I guess that's right. And I says, yeah, so that's God. Mm. And he goes, oh, it kind of took him back, you know, when you get to N plus infinity. And so uh, time went by, he uh, uh, became my boss for just a couple of months. And uh, uh, then whenever he was no longer my boss, he, you know, because he got promoted, I said, so uh, Travis, I shouldn't probably say his name. Um, <laughs> I says, see, there is a God. You're not my boss. <laughs> thank you. All right. Thank you, Paul. God bless you. Yes, sir. What's your name? I'm the other Paul. Oh, Paul squared. Yeah. We have a joke going. Me All and right. Paul. So uh, I was wondering, what is God's in intention or purpose in allowing this woke culture war to spring up around us? And what should a Christian do in response? Well, that's easy. Be a Christian. Actually stand for something. Why does he allow any evil? It's because he allows free will. If he took away our free will, we couldn't make moral choices, could we? So this is a moral world, and we make moral choices, and God allows people to go down the path they want to go down. And there's a point where they're going to get too far down that path, and God knows they're not coming back. He will give them up to their own desire. That's what Paul says in Romans chapter 1. And if you want a great description of our culture, all you need to do is read Romans chapter 1, which was written, as you know, 2,000 years ago. Paul says that when you suppress the truth about God to go your own way, that God gives you up to a futile mind to the point where not only are you doing evil things, but at the, as he says at the end of Romans 1, you're cheering on other people who are doing evil things. And do you see what's going on in California right now? I mean, remember in the good old days when abortion was safe, legal, and rare? Now what is it? People are shouting their abortions. People are doubling down on evil. Governor Newsom wants to kick Walmart out, or not Walmart, Walgreens, because they won't sell the abortion pill over state lines or whatever. They, abortion is now a sacrament. Where does this come from? It comes straight from the pit of hell. It comes from people who keep suppressing the truth to the point that they're given up to a depraved mind, that they're cheering on other people who are doing evil. And whose fault is it? It's our fault. Because we checked out of politics a long time ago. Because we think that we ought not be involved. Are only atheists qualified to run the country? Where does that come from? You only have to answer two questions about politics to see whether Christians ought to be involved. Question number one, should Christians care how people are treated? Is anyone going to say no? Next question, should Christians care how people are treated by their government? Of course. So you ought to be involved politically. It's not our first duty, but it certainly is a duty. Oh, we're just supposed to preach the gospel. Do you realize that your ability to preach the gospel and live the gospel is affected by politics? If you don't think so, go to some of the countries I've been to, Iran, Saudi Arabia, China. We can't do in those countries what we're doing in this country right now because politically they've ruled it out. And so we've been asleep at the switch because we're too afraid that someone's going to unlike us on Facebook. Shame on us. We need to stand for truth and do it now. Because this woke ideology is just going to continue unless Christians start standing up and saying, nope, we love people too much to allow this to continue. We'll take the arrows. We'll take people dissing us. Because it's the right thing to do and we care for people. So that's what we have to do. And we have to do it yesterday. So get busy. Yeah, so I, I was just thinking, this woke ideology has come up because it, he wants Christians to woke up. Because mm -hmm. we've been, I think, uh, increasingly embarrassed about being Christians. And, and you know, he, he wants us to sh let the light shine. And we've been kind of like getting out of the way. So maybe th this is a challenge that he's letting happen for the Christians' people to woke up. Well, hopefully. Hopefully you're right, Paul. Something. I hope that is the case. Thank you. All right. Yes, sir. What's your name? Hello, uh, Chris. Chris, go ahead, yeah. sir. Um, it's a uh, pleasure to be speaking to you today. Oh, thank uh, you. Mr. Same, Turek, Chris. Um, Dr. Turek, um, 
Um, I came out of Catholicism. I'm a new Christian because of one of your videos. It just inspired my oh, my good, journey. So I'm really grateful for that. Now, being a you know former Catholic, um, I was in um, you would say living in sin type mm -hmm. situation. Mm -hmm. I thought I could go on Sunday and confess to a priest, and I was good again until okay. the next week. Um, but um, so the girlfriend that I had at the time. I uh, didn't believe just because we were in a committed relationship. She understood that God talked about marriage, right? A man should leave, you know, and the woman should right. become one flesh. She had a hard time about the ceremony. She said, if we're living together and we have a true bond, a loving relationship, we believe in God, we're serving the Lord, why do we have to have a ceremony? So her whole thing was about the ceremony, and she just wouldn't budge. And, and unfortunately, we're, we're not together anymore because of that, because I, I felt that, you know, we were living in sin at the time. And so... Her whole thing was about the whole ceremony. So I tried to research it, try to come up with something. So I was just wondering if you could help me out with that. Are, are you saying that she didn't want to get married legally or in a church? Or are you saying that the, um, the liturgy of the service she didn't want to go through? Yeah. I mean, did she want to get married or not legally? Uh, so she said that um, she felt we were married already if, if we were just having a committed relationship in front of God. So we didn't need the ceremony or a legal certificate. So it was really, I know it's complex. I, I had a hard time. I would ask her why she thinks that. Why does yeah. she think that's the case? Yeah, I just told her like, we shouldn't just dwell on that. We should, mm -hmm. first of all, uh, deal with our relationship with Christ and, and mm -hmm. then build from there. But she just wouldn't. And I felt like, okay, well, if that's not going to work, then it wasn't just Yeah, to well, be. another thing you have to remember, when, you're, when there's a, a service, a, a marriage service for Christians anyway, mm -hmm. it's an expression to the community that these two people are now in a covenant relationship and before God and the community. So when you go to a service, when I, whenever I officiate a service, I always ask the congregation, are you going to support this couple even when one or both of them want out of the relationship? Because that's why you go, not just to celebrate with them, mm -hmm. but to be supports for them, pledging your support. Yeah. Because when you put two broken people together in one relationship, there's going to be trouble. Right. Marriage is uh -huh. difficult. Yeah. Right? Sure. And so you need the support of friends and community to do it. Yeah. This is why nobody and no Christian should go to a same-sex wedding. At least one reason why you shouldn't go to it. Because for you to go to a same-sex wedding would be for you to say, not only you think it's right, but you will try and keep the couple together in sin. No, you can't yeah. do that as a Christian. Yeah. So I would say that before God, you ought to do it before the community as well. Yeah. And... Uh, that would give you the benefit not only of an official ceremony legally, but also mm -hmm. before your community that would try and keep you together as a couple. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. Because now when I date, I said, my goal is yeah. to get married. I'm not here just to let's waste time. My goal, goal, end goal is to let's, let's form a, a marriage, right. right? So Not only that, if you do it officially, you get a lot of great stuff from Amazon. Yeah, exact, exactly. <laughs> so, so as you know, the dating, uh, you know, hasn't really worked out because a lot of people don't want to get married nowadays, but I still have that belief and, and faith. But um, again, thank you for planting those seeds and was got me the oh, way to Christ. Thank you, so, Chris. Thank you. God bless you. God bless you. All right. All right. Final question right here. Yes, sir. Hi, Frank. I want to say thank you for being here tonight. You're yes, an inspiration. Sir. And Tony? Uh, Mark. Mark. And uh, I could be Tony. I met, a, I met a Tony before. Okay. Mark, go ahead, sir. Uh, I just wanted to say, so I'm a Christian. My mother-in-law is a Jew. She's Jewish, but uh -huh. non-practicing. Uh -huh. um, she says she believes in God, but she doesn't believe that Jesus is God. Yes. So as a Christian, how do I let her know or inform her that she's wrong, that Jesus is God in the flesh? I don't think she's going to take it well. <laughs> Look, you're wrong. <laughs> well, I would ask her the question, if Jesus truly was God, would you worship him? And see what she says. Right? If she hesitates or says no, it's similar to the question, if Christianity were true, would you become a Christian? Very true. Right? Um, but you may uh, take a look at realmessiah.com. That's a book run by my friend Michael Brown, who has written great books on Old Testament prophecy and how it points to Jesus being the true Messiah. And he even refutes what the uh, rabbis say, that Jesus can't be the Messiah because of this, that, or the other thing. And 
Brown refutes it, so I might check out realmessiah.com if she's interested. Now, if she's not interested, there's not much you can do but pray, plant seeds, that I and love her and wait, <laughs> yeah. okay? Uh, Isaiah 53 is a great place to go and see if she, she's willing to read that in her own Tanakh. And if she is, you know, sometimes you can read. You say, I'm going to read something from the Bible, Mom. She's a tough one. She says, who wrote the Bible anyways? Okay. That's well, in this case, it was Isaiah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but you can that. say, um, I'm going to read from the Bible. I want you to tell me who you think this is about. And then ask her after you read it. She's going to say it's about Jesus. And then you can say, is this from the new or the old? She's going to say new. And you're going to say, no, it's Isaiah 53 right here in your old Tanakh. And this is why the rabbis and the synagogues often skip Isaiah 53 yeah. when they get to their readings. Right. So if she's open to the truth, um, maybe there's hope. If she's not, again, pray, plant seeds, love, love and wait. wait. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Frank. All right. Thanks so much, Mark. <laughs> All right. Um, you want to close this out, Pastor Rick? Thanks so much uh, for coming tonight, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, check out our website, crossexamine.org. Also check out Stand to Reason, str.org. Greg and John are here. And uh, we, we're linked to them and so many other ministries. There's, there's no excuse, man. You guys can get answers if you want them. The question is, many people don't really want them. So... Amen. Thank you, Frank. Thanks. Appreciate it. Hey, let's stand together. May the Lord bless you and keep you, cause his face to shine upon you, give his incredible peace, lift up his countenance. May you sense the Lord's smile on your life as you walk and grow in your relationship with Jesus. Thanks for coming tonight. God bless you guys, and have a great week in the Lord until we see you next week.